Welcome everyone to Inside Academia, the weekly program where we take a look behind the ivory curtain seeking a frank discussion of American education. I'm your host, Andy Nash. Today, we're joined by Dr. Michael Oriard, Professor of English and Associate Dean of the College of Liberal Arts at Arden State University. He's also the author of several books, including Bold Over, a Big Time College Football from the 60s to the BCS Era. Also, another author of the book, The Brand NFL, Making and Selling America's Favorite Sport. Uh, Professor Oriard, uh, thanks for joining us today on Inside Academia. Yeah, nice to be with you, Andy. Thank you. I, I would like to talk to you today a little bit about amateurism and collegiate athletics. Uh, this past, uh, tail end this past uh, football season, we've, we've seen the big controversy uh, surrounding the Ohio State issue with uh, Terrell Pryor and a number of the other players there uh, getting in trouble with the NCAA for uh, autographs uh, and uh, other, you know, rings and everything else uh, for uh, uh, various different amounts and tattoos and things like that, and it's caused a huge controversy in, in, in the media. I guess my question to you is, first and foremost, do you believe in today's modern uh, realm of collegiate athletics that is there still genuine, true amateurism in today's college football or basketball? Well, I mean, what I would say is, yeah, that it's – Amateurism still exists, but it exists only for the athletes, and it's imposed upon them by, you know, the NC2A's rules. And, you know, this has been, in, in some ways, the case for a long, long, long time, but, but, but uh, the disparity between the professionalism of everybody else involved and the amateurism of the athletes is becoming more and more extreme and therefore more and more grotesque. So. I mean, to put it quite simply, if you're paying the coach four or five million dollars, but you're not allowing the players to be paid at all beyond their scholarships, you, you have a certain disconnect here. Okay. Now, that was that's a claim that many people have made. Uh, uh, and they've been making that argument now for, for years, for decades, I guess, and this is just the most recent example that how can a uh, school uh, go ahead and profit so much money from uh, the, the, the name, the name recognition, and the, the imagery of the, of the players and at the same time, the players aren't able to even so much as uh, sign an autograph if, if they receive so much as, you know, even a, in a red cent. So I guess the question at that point becomes, well, it, it, do they have to maintain the integrity of amateurism so as to then be able to continue to make more money? Or what is the real argument behind amateurism? Is it just a practical one for monetary purposes uh, so as to preserve the so-called product? of uh, collegiate athletics, or is it because there's a moral idea behind it uh, that distinguishes it from professional sports? Well, you know, I, I think, you know, that's a, it's a complicated question with complicated answers. You know, I think, in fact, that college athletics depends on amateurism, the myth of amateurism, if you will, um, as one of the things that the chief thing that distinguishes it from professional sports, the idea that somehow college football, college basketball is all about love of alma mater and, and uh, representing the students and so on, really is, I think, fundamental to the appeal of the game. <clears throat> you know, the NFL, professional football is much more popular than college football, but college football has its very passionate fans, and I think that that amateurism, that myth of amateurism, is a part of that appeal. As far as the NC2A is concerned, though, it's a very pragmatic thing, a practical thing. I mean, if you abandon uh, amateurism and acknowledge that your athletes really are paid employees and they're just not paid very well right now, then you open up a whole host of, of uh, financial obligations, you know, workman's compensation, you know, adequate compensation just for performing and so on. So it's both practical and ideological. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, I guess the bigger question, too, does the whole system unravel and fall apart if you allow uh, the, uh, I guess, what they would currently refer to as receipt, receipt of personal gain? So, for example, if it would have been okay for those players to uh, to sell what they sold, uh, and would, would the entire myth of amateur, amateurism therefore be shattered with uh, economic ramifications following? Is, is that the concern in the minds of uh, folks in the NCAA? Yeah, I, you know, here, here you really need a lawyer who, who understands the legal ramifications of all these things better than I to answer that, that you know, with, with, with absolute certainty. Mm -hmm. But I think the NC2A could, in fact, relax its rules in some way that, 
that allow the players to be owners of, say, you know, the you know the memorabilia that they are given at bowl games and all of that kind of stuff, and they can sell them, you know, in the same way they could sell their bicycles or whatever. You know, I think that might be possible. Though, you know, it might be one of those deals where you open the door a crack, you, you can't avoid opening it completely, completely wide open. And, and so, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure there. I think the NC2A in its own interest should find whatever legal ways it possibly can to um, allow more compensation in some form or other for athletes to, to simply address, you know, this, this huge disparity. Because if it's not able to do that, it makes itself that much more vulnerable to lawsuits on behalf of athletes, uh, athletes' rights lawsuits, such as the O'Bannon case that's, that's you know, working its way through the courts right now, which could have, you know, a, you know really you know, cataclysmic impact on college sports as we now know it. Well, you know, the, the NCAA and, and the schools, obviously, uh, they all argue that, uh, hey, look, a lot of these players, they're getting a free ride, full scholarship, obviously, so they don't have to pay anything academically. Everything's paid for. And if you add up the cost of all of that, if they would have had to have paid for that, that would, that, that would, that would be several tens of thousands of dollars uh, in a given one year. Uh, mm -hmm. So they, you can make the argument that I'm sure the NCAA has argued that, that they're being compensated in that respect. Um, is, that a fair con is that a fair argument in your opinion? On, on the part uh, of the NCAA. You know, again, I, got, I have two responses to that. One is, um, okay, I played college football in the 1960s, mm -hmm. and uh, I actually was a walk-on, but my last three semesters I was on scholarship, and um, I got tuition, room, and board. And, <clears throat> you know, my coach at that time, Eric Partsegan at Notre Dame, I, I have no idea how much he made his, in salary, but I'm guessing it was somewhere between twenty five fifty thousand dollars $50,000. Today, you know, a scholarship athlete, you know, gets more monetary value, but it's the same tuition, room, and board that I receive with a little bit of spending money. Right. Uh, but that coach who is making twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars is making two to five million dollars a day. So, so you have this this growing disparity of a a situation that has existed for a long, long time has gotten more extreme. Okay. So. So, uh, you know, that, that, that's one consideration. The other consideration is, <clears throat> you know, what you're talking about with uh, tuition, board and room, and, and a college education and so on is an implicit contract with the athletes. That in return for your athletic services, we will give you an education. And an education is as valuable, or maybe even more valuable today. As we all know, a college degree is no guarantee of, of employment in this, you know, fiercely competitive job market. But without it, the opportunities are virtually nil. Uh, so then the question becomes, is, the, are, is college football delivering, is college sports delivering on that implicit contract? Are young athletes, particularly in those two sports, uh, basketball and football, truly getting an education? And here, you know, we don't have absolutely clear data, but, but certainly there is large reason to, con to be concerned that maybe they are not getting a very good education, you know, and I'm talking about graduation rates, I'm talking about clustering in certain easy majors that may or may not even prepare them for the job market, you know, mm -hmm. jobs out there are very competitive, it's all meritocratic, you know, no longer, you know, are boosters going to just hire the former players because, you know, the, you know, the good old guys and that sort of thing, you know, so um, if, if in fact universities are still truly educating you know, student athletes, then they're getting some real benefit from it. And if they're failing to do that, then, uh, you know, despite the tuition in the board and room, um, they're not getting much at all, if anything. Right, exactly. And I guess, I mean, the reason we're talking about this is because it seems as though the, the restrictions on the players in terms of uh, what they could possibly get as personal gain seems to be, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the last vestige of amateurism, the last tangible vestige of amateurism that, 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 that is left. Because mm -hmm. as you said, you know, as we all know, the coaches and the schools, the programs, it's a multi-million, I mean, I don't know, $100 million industry or maybe more than that. And so there's so much money riding on the line that the last vestige of amateurism is, is that the players can't profit personally from it. I don't know, the, the biggest question that people have is that if you shatter that, if you, if you knock out that last brick, then what happens to it? Does it continue to be this incredibly lucrative enterprise that it's become today, or does the whole thing fall apart like a house of cards? Yeah, and to that, I don't have the answer. Um, 
you know, one can wonder about these things, speculate about these things, but, you know, we won't know until we get there. Will, in fact, say, say some court decision force the NC2A to allow athletes to negotiate contracts or, you know, to capitalize in some way on, on their, their fame, notoriety, and so on. Um, if, in fact, you know, uh, universities were, in effect, forced to to set up openly semi-professional kinds of operations, mm -hmm. would it in fact damage uh, the appeal of the game to fans, or would fans just adjust to that the way they adjust to everything? You know, right. that, that's a hard question. I mean, we got to keep in mind here that, that the scholarship that we're talking about was itself uh, uh, an absolute clear sign of professionalism. You know, we, the scholarships were not even approved by the NC2A until 1956. Until 1956, the idea of compensating an athlete for athletic ability as opposed for scholastic promise or whatever was considered professionalism. So, you know, that first break with, with uh, the, the code of amateurism was, in fact, the creation of the athletic scholarship. It was called a scholarship as opposed to, say, an athletic, um, you know, reward. You know, to create, maintain the illusion that it was about education and not about athletics. But, but of course, it was always about athletics. So, you know, everybody adjusted to that one pretty easily. Would we adjust to, you know, some new arrangement? You know, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm guessing possibly, but I don't know that for certain. So, in a nutshell, what's your forecast? I mean, given the fact that over the course of the last few, several <laughs> decades, it's gone from what it was in your day to what it is now. Huge business. Mm -hmm. Where you see it in the next ten to twenty years? Well, you know, I'm not a particularly good prophet, but what, what I am <laughs> fairly confident in, in saying that I think a dramatic change is going to come about, but it's not going to come about by dramatic change from within the NC2A. It's going to come about from some dramatic change from outside the NC2A. Mm -hmm. Over this past year, with all the conference realignment going on, and and you know the controversies over the BCS, not about you know not crowning a um, an undisputed national champion, but about unevenly distributing the enormous resources, uh, the financial windfall from athletics. You know, we, we, we've seen how, <clears throat> you know, there are cracks within the system, but, you know, what's going to happen is, say, this O'Bannon case. Uh, for your viewers who are not familiar with that, that's a couple former players suing <clears throat> over the EA Sports, you know, the maker of video games, use of their images for their video games without compensation to them. But that touches on the whole larger issue of who owns the images of, you know, football and basketball players and can capitalize them on them. You know, if, if the athletes win those lawsuits and some decision is made that athletes, in fact, are workers entitled to, you know, proper compensation for their performances, then some really tremendous reorganization, restructuring of college sports will happen. My guess is you would have some kind of super conference that's, you know, semi-professional and right. the rest of this will go another way. But I think that will come from without. I, I can't imagine the NC2A deciding that from within. And, and, and it creates a whole host of problems. One thing, what do you, Title IX, you know, if, if you're going to be paying football and basketball players some stipend for playing, well, what about women's basketball players in sure. Germany? And so, on. Sure. so, I mean, this, this would be a tremendous upheaval in college athletics of the sort that's not even imaginable from within the NC2A. I would think that the NC2A, and it's they're meeting right now in San Antonio, and whether they'll do it this session or it'll be, you know, a year or two down the road, is going to have to address this notion of, you know, in effect, property rights for right. uh, athletes. And if it does it in some kind of incremental, you know, way that doesn't disrupt the whole system, uh, they might hold off this, this uh you know, eventual upheaval. But okay. it's, to me, it's just a matter of time before that happens. All right. Well, very good. Well, I'm sure these weren't the, the last uh, of the type of these type of cases that, that, that we've seen here. So well, with that, uh, we're just about out of time here. So I'm going to thank you, uh, Professor Oriard, uh, once again for joining us today. Again, uh, you're English professor at Arden State University and associate dean. I want to thank you for joining us today on Inside Academia. My name is Andy Nash. Check us out again uh, next week, as every week. Uh, where we take a look behind the ivory curtain.